Uh, thank you, Professor Zweig, for the very kind introduction. Thank you all for coming, and especially delighted to see my students in, in the seminar this year and, uh, and in years uh, past, as well as, uh, as, well as friends that uh, my wife and I have made uh, over the years. One minor correction to Professor Zweig's uh, introduction. I actually represented in, in Washington Prime Minister Rabin, Prime Minister Perez after the assassination. And for three months, I represented after a fashion also Benjamin Netanyahu. In, when he was elected uh, in 1996, uh, I resigned, not in protest, but uh, uh, when I was Rabin's and Perez's ambassador, I, I was also a policy maker and uh, part of the policy and its making. And uh, since I did not vote for Mr. Netanyahu and, and thought that I, I would have reasons to disagree with his policies, uh, there was no point in, in being his ambassador. I was not a professional diplomat, but somebody who was brought from, from the outside. So uh, I called him on the phone and uh, it was an interesting conversation. I said to him, uh, to the same extent that you understand that I cannot stay, I understand that you need to appoint your own person, so let's do it in a civilized way. And he said, can you stay for three months uh, for continuity's sake? And I said, sure, and I stayed for three months. So there I, there I was, not in the same capacity that I, I worked with uh, Yitzhak Rabin and Shimon Peres, but enough to see a relationship between Prime Minister Netanyahu and uh, US President that there's some similarities to what we see now. So we'll, we'll revisit that point later, uh, later on. Uh, I feel uh, fortunate to, to, be a, to be speaking to you in the wake of two excellent presentations that were made here in previous weeks, <coughs> in one by Walter Mead and the other by uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron Miller. Walter Mead uh, spoke about uh, the Israel lobby, and uh, had an interesting thesis. He said that the Israel lobby, of course, very well known for its uh, effectiveness and in a way controversial, is not, as, is not as effective as you would have thought because it operates in an environment when there is a very strong pro-Israel sentiment in the non-Jewish community. And uh, the relationship between what the lobby accomplishes and the extent support for Israel in large swath of uh, the American public uh, is oftentimes obscure and, and misunderstood. He did say that that support is more on the popular level, that there is a clear erosion of support for Israel uh, in the intelligentsia in, in the United States, and uh, that again is a point I will come back to. And, and then more recently, uh, we all listened to uh, Aaron Miller, uh, a colleague of mine in, in the peace process of the 1990s from the, the American side and author of uh, The Much to Promise Land um, with interesting insights into the way uh, America makes policy and, and tries to make peace between Arabs and Israelis in the, uh, in the Middle East. And where I would like to, to begin is uh, uh, where uh, Walter Mead said that support for Israel is the weakest, that is to say, in the intelligentsia, where there has been an erosion of, of support. And I would like to look at narratives. Narratives underlie policy. Decisions are made by uh, political leaders, by policymakers, for a variety of reasons in the service of interests, uh, <coughs> in, in the service of, uh, in order to promote a doctrine they, uh, uh, they uphold in response to an immediate uh, crisis, but uh, in the longer range, they, they also reflect the, the dominant narratives in the society. It's, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to, conduct a, uh, uh, to conduct a policy that runs against the grain of uh, the deeper layers of uh, public opinion, and uh, Walter Mead gave us the example of a very effective lobby, the tobacco lobby, that at some point simply ceased to be effective because smoking became so controversial that uh, there was even the, the best paid Madison Avenue PR persons could not make 
uh, smoking a good, a good cause. So uh, let us look at, at some, of these, uh, some of these narratives. And I'd, I'd like to begin uh, with a quote. The quote is from uh, the written testimony deposited by General uh, Petraeus, the celebrated head of CENTCOM, the Central Command, who testified before the uh, Senate's uh, Armed Services Committee on, last, on March 16, and uh, spoke mostly about US policy in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, when he uh, enumerated some of the difficulties, the challenges that US policy faces, um, he said the following. Uh, he said, insufficient progress towards comprehensive Middle Eastern peace. The enduring hostilities between Israel and some of its neighbors uh, present distinct challenges to our ability to advance our interest in the area of operations, in the area of responsibility. Israeli-Palestinian tensions often flare into violence and large-scale armed confrontations. The conflict foments anti-American sentiment due a perception of U.S. favoritism for Israel. Arab anger over the Palestinian question limits the strength and depth of U.S. partnerships with governments and peoples in the area of responsibility and weakens the legitimacy of moderate regimes in the Arab world. Meanwhile, Al-Qaeda and other militant groups exploit that anger to mobilize support. The conflict also gives Iran influence in the Arab world to its clients, Lebanese Hezbollah and Hamas. So what uh, General Petraeus did by uh, including this uh, paragraph in, in his written testimony was to endorse what we call the linkage thesis or the linkage theory. The linkage theory uh, maintains that there is a close linkage between U.S. support for Israel and the problems that the United States faces in the, uh, in the Middle East. After 9-11, you remember the often asked question, why do they hate us? Well, the answer, if you uphold the linkage, is they hate us because we support Israel. This actually is not a new linkage. Uh, the origins of the linkage theory go back to an earlier era when the imperial power in the Middle East was not the United States but Great Britain. And among British policymakers, there was a similar conviction. They said, oh, there is a natural alliance between Britain and Arab nationalism, and we and the Arabs could have been great friends, but for the Balfour Declaration, but for our support for the idea of a Jewish national home. If this could only go away, the natural kinship between Englishmen and Arabs, a la Lawrence, uh, would come to the fore, and we would have no problems in the Middle East. Well, the counter-narrative to this narrative argued they, they don't like you, uh, you are not compatible with Arab nationalism because you are a colonial power. You rule over Arabs, you exploit Arabs, you take their oil, you have military bases, they don't like to be subjugated, they would like to be independent, and since you refuse to give them independence and insist on keeping your dominion in the Middle East, they don't like you. Now, supporting the Jewish National Home in Palestine doesn't help, but it is not the root cause of your problem in the Middle East. So that, that was a famous argument in the 20s, 30s, and, and 40s. And by the end of the 1940s, Britain had to leave the Middle East pretty much under American pressure, and the United States inherited the position of the major Western power in the Middle East. And it came in with a, uh, with a sense that things should be fine. After all, the United States was not an imperial power. It did not have colonies. It did not have a colonial past in the Middle East. It even pushed Britain and France out. And it should have been a natural friend with Arab nationalism. And you may rem remember or remember reading about how John Foster Dulles and Eisenhower quoted Abdul Nasser, the great leader of Egypt and Arab nationalism, and. Uh, <coughs> Uh, thought that uh, he was going to be their friend, and it ended up in disappointment and failure. And again, the same two narratives showed up. One argued, well, of course we are unsuccessful 
in the Middle East. Of course, the Soviets are successful in displacing us in the Middle East because we support the state of Israel and the Soviets support Arab nationalism against the state of Israel. So here is the linkage and therefore we should limit our relationship with, uh, uh, with Israel and invest more in cultivating our friendship with Arab nationalism and things would sort themselves out. The counter narrative argued, well, America may not have had a colonial past in the Middle East, but it does have a colonial present. It is uh, uh, a global power. Uh, it has interests in the Middle East. It is there to promote its own interests. Its interests include oil. Its interests include shoring up conservative tyrannical regimes that are friendly to the United States, fighting revolutionary forces that want to topple these regimes. And when, for instance, in Iran in the 1950s, a nationalist leader called Mossadegh uh, was about to replace the Shah and wanted to nationalize oil, he was toppled by the CIA in a famous coup engineered by one uh, Kermit Kim Roosevelt. So in short order, the United States acquired uh, the legacy of uh, colonial uh, imperial power and, uh, and replaced uh, Great Britain. So the, the same argument between the narrative and the counter narrative uh, uh, emerged. Uh, so this, this debate uh, was a very important debate inside uh, the State Department, other policy making agencies of uh, the US government uh, in, in Congress until it was given an interesting a fresh twist in the 1970s by Henry Kissinger. Uh, Henry Kissinger uh, objected uh, to the initiative taken by Secretary of State Rogers, who was Nixon's first Secretary of State until he was replaced by the same Henry Kissinger. And Rogers, in 1969, published the Rogers Plan. He said, we are about to lose our friends. There was a coup d'etat in, uh, in Libya, and the king was toppled by Muammar Gaddafi. If we do not take a certain distance from Israel, we will lose all our friends in the Middle East. And therefore, we should pressure Israel to uh, return all the territories captured in 1967 without actually getting a peace, uh, peace treaty in return. And Henry Kissinger argued that this was not a wise policy. He said, if you do that, you will play into the hands of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is the patron of Egypt and Syria and the Arab radicals. And if you just give Egypt back to Sinai and you give Syria back the Golan Heights, without a change in orientation, the beneficiary would be the Soviet Union. The dividends would be Soviet dividends. He said, we should make it clear to the Arabs that we are willing to exert pressure on Israel, to persuade Israel to return the Sinai to Egypt and uh, the Golan Heights to, to Syria, if Egypt and Syria change their foreign policy and sh shift or move their way from the Soviet orbit to our orbit, then it would make sense from our point of view because we are the only power who has influence over Israel and we should use our assets, our Israeli assets, in order to reorient Arab policies and politics. And indeed, the greatest coup of the Cold War happened in the early and mid 1970s when Anwar Sadat, the leader of Egypt, jumped off the Soviet bandwagon and uh, moved to the American orbit. And in the course of, of doing that, began to make peace with Israel in his stages. Henry Kissinger did not quite see the process mature into a peace process. This happened under the presidency of, of Jimmy Carter, but the roots of that policy uh, were laid uh, during the period, uh, or planted during the period of Henry Kissinger. So here was the new twist. He said, yes, there is a certain tension, but the United States, given that uh, it is the only international power that can talk to both Israelis and Arabs and has influence both among Israelis and Arabs, should use that influence to generate peace be between Israelis and Arabs and build its own diplomatic capital by doing that. And in that regard, uh, when that happens, the tension between the two narratives disappears. And 
Indeed, since in, uh, December 1973, uh, the end of the October War, we have had in uh, ups and uh, <coughs> fits and starts uh, a peace process between Israel and the Arabs, always orchestrated by the United States and yielding diplomatic dividends to the, uh, uh, to the United States. In what we call the height of the peace process, the peace process of the 1990s, the Madrid conference, and then the Oslo accord between Israel and the Palestinians, Israeli-Jordanian peace, uh, the Middle East economic conferences, all these achievements of the 1990s, um, they, they were started by the Bush-Baker administration in the aftermath of the first Gulf War and were adopted and pushed forward by uh, President Clinton, who made this policy uh, his own. So that was fine and good as long as there was a peace process. But this, this of course, changed when the peace process collapsed in, uh, uh, in 2000. First, the Syrian track, and then the Palestinian track in the failed Camp David conference, and then uh, when the so-called Second Intifada uh, broke out. Now, there wasn't much peace process during the eight, uh, eight years tenure of uh, George W. Bush. Uh, he had a, a different outlook on the Middle East. He was interested more in, in fighting the authoritarian regimes in the East, that is to say Iraq and, and Iran. He wanted first to bring democracy to the Middle East and, and then make peace. It was a, a very different doctrine articulated mostly by the neocon intellectuals that worked for the Bush administration. That was not a particularly successful, uh, successful policy. Um, but Bush's relationship with, uh, with Israel <coughs> were very close and, and intimate. Um, since uh, September 11, uh, defining element in his policy was the war on terror. Israel was on the right side of that war. Yasser Arafat was on the wrong side of, of that war. Syria was on the wrong side of, of that war. And therefore, Israel and, and Bush could have a, a comfortable relationship, um, even though there was not a peace process. But things changed. A new president came in, and Barack Obama made, made it clear during his campaign that uh, he had two, two very important priorities among his foreign policy priorities. One was uh, to settle the relationship and the tension between the United States, the Muslim and Arab worlds, and secondly, to restart the peace process uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East. In that, implicitly, uh, he did re-endorse the idea of the linkage. Um, that uh, if, if we want a better relationship with Arabs and uh, Muslims, we need to deliver uh, an Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Mind you, not Israeli-Syrian. The president understands correctly that most Arabs and Muslims do not quite care about Syria and, and the Golan Heights. Some of them may even relish in Syria's failure to regain the Golan Heights. But the Palestinian issue is important to many uh, Arabs and, and Muslims. And here he reestablished the, um, re the, the linkage. He was, in that regard, uh, following the recommendations of uh, you may remember the uh, bipartisan Baker Hamilton Commission that was established in 2006 in order to deal with the question of what to do about Iraq. And uh, the commission recommended that, uh, among other things, the United States should start, um, should start a peace process, an Arab-Israeli peace process, should engage with Iran and, and Syria. And uh, President Obama, or candidate Obama at the time, pretty much bought on to these, uh, to these ideas. Now, uh, General Petraeus, uh, in his written testimony, essentially adopted this. And this is significant because the president, at the end of the day, is a, is a political figure. His personal ambitions, as, uh, sometimes political partisan agendas, the military, the military establishment, are perceived as objective arbiters of the national interest. And when General Petraeus says that, or puts it in writing, uh, that has a different resonance. I, I make a distinction between says and puts in writing because there was a difference between the written statement and what he actually said. And there were several blogs 
trying to argue that what I read to you is not exactly what the general said. And to this I say, this is not really so important. Uh, the important thing is that either the general or his staff thought that this is what should be in the written testimony that becomes the official document that, that's in, in the records. So uh, here is, is one narrative that from an Israeli parochial point of view is, is not, a good, not a good narrative. There's a, a second negative development of a, another narrative from Israel's point of view, and that is the narrative that has to do with Iran and Iran's nuclear weapons. Um, when Ariel Sharon was the Prime Minister of Israel and the clock began to tick on uh, Iran's nuclear program, Sharon, uh, who I would say parenthetically, was a much more moderate, pragmatic Prime Minister than the earlier Sharon, uh, who was known <coughs> as a somewhat of a wild man, but as a Prime Minister he, he was a different person. He said, we should not push to the head of the line. Let us not make it an Israeli issue. That the world must not think that this is a, an Israeli issue, because it's not. If Iran goes nuclear, it's going to affect the whole Middle East and the whole world. Uh, Iran with the nuclear umbrella is, is a country that, that would jeopardize its uh, neighbors. Uh, if Iran goes nuclear, so would Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, and we'll have a, a nuclear Middle East. Uh, and with people like Ahmadinejad, with a finger near a, a nuclear uh, button, this is something that is dangerous for the whole world, not, not just for Israel. If we push to the, hand, to the head of the line, it's going to be identified too closely uh, with us, and it would become an Israeli issue, which is not, not in our interest. Secondly, it would raise the issue of Israel's nuclear ambiguity. Now, as you know, uh, Israel has had for years, uh, since the 1970s, or actually 60s, going back to the days of, of Kennedy, who did raise the issue with David Ben-Gurion, a policy of nuclear ambiguity. Say, Israel does not announce anything with regard to, to its own nuclear program. It did, does not sign the NPT, the Non-Proliferation non Treaty, and therefore is, is not infringing it. It lets everybody assume that that it has nuclear weapons. It uses the formula, Israel will not be the first to introduce nuclear weapons into the region. And actually for several decades now, everybody or almost everybody has lived comfortably with it and it's been adopted as also by the United States as a policy that the United States support implicitly, if not explicitly. Now, you can only expect that when pressure is exerted on, on Iran not to develop a nuclear weapon and when sanctions are imposed or when a military action is threatened, the natural response of Iran or allies of Iran like Turkey would be, why the double standard? What about Israel? Let Israel end its nuclear ambiguity. Let Israel sign the, the NPT. And you can even think of a, of a point in time in which some messenger of goodwill, as it were, would say, you know, there's a deal in the offing. Iran will not develop a nuclear weapon, but Israel will have to give up on, on whatever arsenal it has in what we call the textile factory in Dimona, in the south of, uh, uh, in the, south of the country. And unfortunately, the original Israeli narrative that Iran is a menace to the whole world, that an Iranian nuclear development is dangerous for the whole world, has been pushed aside by a narrative that makes it primarily an Israeli issue. When Walt and Mersheimer published their, their book, The Israel Lobby, which tries to say that US foreign policy in the Middle East has been hoodwinked by the Israel Lobby, uh, one of the arguments is, you know, a, a nuclear Iran is an existential threat for Israel. It's not an existential threat <coughs> for the United States. Therefore, implicitly, the United States can live with a nuclear Iran, Israel cannot. And again, the argument in, uh, that Walter and Mersheimer made was, 
the same people who dragged the United States to war in Iraq, that is to say the Jewish neocons, presumably in the service of Israel, are now trying to drag the United States into a conflict with Iran. And the United States should not be dragged because ultimately the United States can find a modus vivendi with Iran. Israel cannot, but the national interest of the United States should not be subordinated to those of, of Israel. So unfortunately, the original Israeli narrative of these two interrelated issues, the Iranian issue and the nuclear issue, is again pushed aside and the stage is, is being dominated more and more by this other narrative. Finally, the, uh, the narrative of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, there is not a single Israeli narrative. Israel is a deeply divided society uh, many, uh, on many counts and several issues, but the single most important issue that has divided the uh, Israeli political system since 1967 is the debate on the future of Judea and Samaria or the West Bank. And at the time, I would also have said the Gaza, Gaza Strip, but Gaza has now been, uh, Israel withdrew from the Gaza Strip, uh, dismantled the settlements, and we have a Hamas government in Gaza. But the, the debate on the future of the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, depending on your point of view in Israel, is the single most important debate. Uh, and the debate shifts, and the, the balance of power inside the Israeli political system shifts. Let, let us look at, uh, at, recent, uh, at recent events. In 1993, uh, Yitzhak Rabin signed the, uh, the Oslo Accords with the Palestinians. He was ass assassinated for that reason in 1995. Uh, his successor, Shimon Peres, was defeated in the elections in 1996 by Benjamin Netanyahu who did withdraw out of Hebron and did sign the Y plantation agreement on another 13% of the West Bank, but was then overthrown by the right wing. And Ehud Barak won the elections. And Ehud Barak tried in one fell swoop during a year and a half to make peace with both Syria and the Palestinians and ended up in complete failure, peace with neither. He was defeated politically. Ariel Sharon came. Ariel Sharon was not interested in dealing with Syria. He did not believe that you could make a final status agreement with the Palestinians, but he did believe that we should act unilaterally because we could not afford to continue to occupy this territory. And interestingly, Ariel Sharon, who for years was the leader of the radical right wing in Israel, began to use the term occupy. He said this was an occupation that we, the state of Israel could no longer afford. 20 years earlier, he would not have said occupation, he would have said liberation. In 67, according to the Israeli right wing, these ancestral lands were liberated. According to the Israeli left, they were occupied. According to those who want to be neutral, they were administered. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Sharon began to use the language of occupation. He really changed his mind. Uh, then he fell ill and he was replaced by Ehud Olmert. And Ehud Olmert negotiated both with Syria and the Palestinians. And Ehud Olmert put on the table in his negotiation with the leader of the Palestinian Authority, Abu Mazen or Mahmoud Abbas, a very far-reaching proposal, it, willing to withdraw from about 94, 95 percent of the West Bank, to keep four or five percent of the West Bank where the large blocks of settlement um, were uh, are concentrated, and offering return a swap of sovereign Israeli territory as compensation to, to the Palestinians and to partition Jerusalem and even to take, uh, to take in a symbolic number of Palestinian refugees, if not accepting them, at least respecting the Palestinian claim of return. A very far-reaching offer for somebody who used to be one of the young promises of the Likud, who was one of the right-hand persons of Prime Minister Shamir, on the, on the radical right, made that far-reaching offer. Abu Mazen did not take it. I, it. It's to be explained by the fact that Olmet was on his way out, and Palestinian leaders and other leaders don't like to make agreements with politicians who are on their way out. They, normally, you, you like to make your agreement with the person who also has to implement it. So 
it, it can possibly be explained, but uh, of course, when Olmert left, there was a fresh election and the right wing won in Israel. Uh, and the largest caucus in the Israeli parliament is of the Kadima party headed by Tzipi Livni. This is Ariel Sharon and Eul Olmert's party. This is a center, center left party that believes in a diplomatic solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And it has the largest caucus, one more than Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud, but the Knesset has a right-wing complexion and she was not able to form a, a government and Benjamin Netanyahu formed the right-wing government. And so, you say, you ask me, what is the dominant Israeli narrative now? It's the narrative of, uh, of the Likud and of Benjamin Netanyahu, which says that, uh, yes, there can be a two-state solution, but not right now. This is not the time. Uh, Abu Mazen is weak. Uh, Gaza is actually ruled, is, not, is really ruled by Hamas, and therefore we would not be talking about a two-state solution, but a three-state solution. Let's go for economic peace in the time building. And when the Palestinians are ready and they have a civil society and a right economy and a, a sufficient security forces to prevent terrorism, then we can talk seriously. Uh, and uh, there is the other approach of the Kadima party or the Labour party that says, this is no longer Yasser Arafat, this is Abu Mazen who genuinely wants to make peace. Yes, he cannot deliver Gaza, but uh, the agreement can be signed and need not be implemented right away, but we must sign the agreement because it is in our interest to begin with. Uh, there is a demographic problem. If we stay with the same demographic uh, issue, um, uh, with, the, with the same, uh, with the status quo, then in 15, 20 years, there would be a Palestinian majority between the Jordan and the Mediterranean, and the next step would be a demand for one man, one vote, and this would be the end of uh, Israel as we know it. This would be the one state solution that is a non-Jewish, non-Zionist state, but a binational state. And therefore, says the uh, labor, or says, the, says Kadima, even if the Palestinians are not eager to do it, it is in our interest to force them to accept the two-state solution before it is, it is too late. Because we do hear voices on the Palestinian side that said, Actually, we shouldn't hurry. Time is on our side, and in the battle of the cradle, we are bound to win, so let us just, let us just wait. Uh, the narrative of, uh, of the Obama administration is, of course, not Netanyahu's narrative. As I said, he came in determined that he needs to see a resolution of the Palestinian problem uh, in order to uh, uh, build the dialogue, the engagement, with the Arab and, and Muslim world. There is another linkage. Uh, I'm now moving to, to the more practical aspects of, of the policy, and that is the linkage between the Iranian issue and the Palestinian issue. It's an unwritten linkage, but an important one. And it, it would have said the same, uh, would have said the following. I, President Obama, or I, the United States, I undertake to resolve the Iranian problem. Um, the United States does say this is a position of the administration articulated many times by the President and by the sec Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense that it's not acceptable that Iran will have a nuclear weapon. And the United States will do everything in its power to prevent Iran from uh, having a nuclear weapon. Well, this could be empty phrases or it could be a real policy. If it becomes a real policy, then you can, you can say to the Prime Minister of Israel, you know, here is the deal. I will really prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapon. You say that this is your most important concern. But on your side of the equation, I need to see real progress. I need to see a new negotiation with the Palestinians, and I need to see an agreement with the Palestinians. So I solve your Iranian problem, and you facilitate my dialogue with the Arab and, and Muslim world. Could have, been, uh, could have been the deal, uh, uh, but it, it, has not, it has not been the case. And I now come to, uh, to the issue of the relationship between the Obama administration and the Netanyahu, Netanyahu government. Um, from early on, from the first meeting 
as uh, president and, and prime minister, um, this has not been uh, this has not been a love story. Actually, the two men met previously when Obama was a candidate and Netanyahu himself was a candidate, and you know, this was uh, these were uh, easier and uh, easier meetings. The, there was no agenda, and one did not have to be. Uh, <coughs> Uh, committal in, in what one, one said, but in the first business meeting as uh, a president and prime minister, uh, the president wanted, wanted the prime minister to, to commit uh, to a two-state solution and to real progress to the Palestinians, and Netanyahu would not. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, the president demanded a unilateral Israeli concession, that is to say, a freeze on, on settlement. Now, the, here are two mistakes. See, one was Netanyahu's mistake. The most important relationship that Israel's prime minister has is with the president of the United States. There's no need to elaborate on the significance of the relationship for Israel. And on the important personal element in the relationship between the president and the prime minister. I said uh, I had the privilege of uh, seeing one wonderful relationship build up between uh, Robin and Clinton and other good relationship between uh, Clinton and, and others, and a tense relationship between uh, Clinton and Netanyahu at, uh, uh, at the time. And I, I know full well what the importance of that personal relationship is. Yes, there are state interests, but there's always a personal prism through which the president looks at the relationship. And the president wants to know that he can trust the Prime Minister of Israel. They can disagree, but he wants to hear from the Prime Minister of Israel, here is my policy, as I articulate to you on the, on the assumption that there is full trust between us, and I can tell you things that I cannot say openly or even share with my constituency. I want your support. I want your endorsement, and you in turn want to know what my roadmap is. That is an essential element in the relationship, and I think Netanyahu made a mistake by not sharing with Obama in the first meeting and in the second and third meeting what his ultimate agenda is. Obama made a mistake of uh, demanding a unilateral concession from Israel, uh, namely a complete freeze on, on settlements. And that was a mistake because it created an expectation on the Arab side that the United States will from now on, quote unquote, deliver Israel. And when President Obama went to, uh, to Cairo uh, to give his speech to, uh, to the Arab and, and Muslim world, he made a stop in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he did go to meet with uh, uh, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia to ask him for a concession for an act of goodwill towards Israel, to allow Israeli overflights of Saudi territory on, on their way to, uh, to the Far East, and he was given a flat, flat no. And yet he continued with his pressure on Netanyahu, which of course created the mood in the Arab world. Fine, you know, if the United States is leaning on Israel and wants to, uh, to extract unilateral concessions with Israel, we can sit back in the gallery and, and watch the United States and expect the United States to deliver, uh, to deliver Israel. And that is with some variations, some further steps, where we, where we are now. It's now an open row. Uh, the president doesn't do it publicly, but uh, when he meets with foreign leaders, he shares his frustration with uh, Netanyahu, with international leaders. And Netanyahu doesn't do it directly, but he has his friend. He, President of the World Jewish Congress, Ronald Lauder, and Elie Wiesel publish ads in the American press criticizing President uh, Obama, uh, and there is a, uh, a tug of war between, uh, <coughs> between uh, the administration and the government of uh, Israel, which of course is, uh, is a very negative development. So how do, uh, how do we deal with that? And here at this point, I would like to dispense some unsolicited advice to, to both sides. Uh, let me begin with my own government. Uh, say advice, uh, advice number one. Uh, 
change the policy. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, it is in our interest uh, to make peace and said at least to have a peace process. You may discover in the peace process that you really do not have a partner, that Abu Mazen cannot deliver, that Hamas is more powerful than, uh, uh, than the Palestinian Authority, that Bashar al-Assad in Syria is not a partner for a peace process. But you have to find out, and the only way to find it out is to enter into a serious peace process. You get the dividends of uh, no longer appearing to be recalcitrant, but to be, to be of goodwill, cooperative. You'll buy a lot of, of goodwill. Uh, Israel's stock is not doing too well internationally. There is a whole delegitimizing campaign, and you go a long way towards countering that by entering into a, a, into a peace process. Uh, number two, go for electoral reform in Israel. Uh, one, of the, one of the main problems, one of the main problems in, in our making choices, and I, I just referred earlier to, to the big debates in Israeli society, and the government needs at some point to make a decision in these debates and take the country in a particular direction, but it needs to be able to govern. And the electoral system and the political system as they are now are not, do not enable us to do that. Think of, uh, think of the present coalition. Uh, Netanyahu, you need 61 members of the Knesset to have a majority and not a stable majority. To have a stable majority, you want at least 70 members out of the 120 of the Knesset. You begin with 28, which is your own party. And you don't even control your own party because of the primary system. Several party members are to the right of Benjamin Netanyahu. So when, when the prime minister has to think day in and day out about his political survival, how does he control his own party and the coalition, it's very difficult to make policy. Think, think of American politics. Think you have one state where you have a recall. That's California. And you remember a few years ago, the government was, was recalled. Imagine that every politician in the United States, every governor, um, the president, would be under the daily threat of, of a recall and, and think how effective the US government would be under these uh, circumstances. Thirdly, narratives. I mentioned the, the narratives, the uh, narratives that we're not doing too well with. And it's important for, it's important for the uh, government of Israel not to, not to deal with daily, uh, daily PR, but daily PR is important in itself, but, but to think of how you shape the underlying narratives that affect international attitudes towards you. And speaking of daily PR, improve your diplomacy. And, uh, uh, both pure diplomacy, you may, you may recall the incident where the Deputy Foreign Minister of Israel humiliated the Turkish ambassador by making him sit on a lowly bench and bringing the, the cameras in. That's unthinkable in diplomatic terms, particularly when you deal with a proud country like, uh, uh, like, like Turkey. Uh, two, two questions of dealing with, with the media. In, in, today's, uh, in today's world, where the CNN camera is, is not less important than where the motor is in a, in a scene. We, we don't conduct conventional wars anymore. We conduct uh, asymmetrical wars between the IDF and irregular armies embedded among civilians. This is bound to be messy, and it can never make very good PR, but at least you can minimize uh, uh, the uh, damage. And finally, think positively about your partners in the region. If I mentioned Iran before, most of the Arabs and most of the Arab states are terrified of the Iranians. They see Iran as the major danger to their regimes, to their, uh, to their stability. Uh, they are not going to be openly cooperative with Israel. It is not easy for a country like Saudi Arabia or in a country like Egypt to openly collaborate with Israel against another 
Muslim country like, like Iran. But there are many other ways to, to collaborate and we should make a much greater investment in building these, uh, these partnerships. And when these partnerships flourish, it would also be easier for the United States to exercise its friendship with Israel without a sense that it is uh, antagonizing the Arab world. Now, a few pieces of unsolicited advice for the United States. So, President Obama embraced the Israeli public. The Israeli public loves to be loved. Israel is an insecure society for a reason. We have a history, both Jewish history and Israeli history, that warrants uh, some paranoia. And we love to be loved. Foreign leaders who have articulated love and emotion towards the Israeli public became heroes, from Bill Clinton to King Hussein. Uh, if either of them ran in Israeli elections, it would have been a home run. <laughs> so President Obama has not spoken to the Israeli public. He went to Turkey in the neighborhood. He went to Cairo in the neighborhood. He didn't come to Israel. He did send his vice president. That happened to have been not a great visit. <laughs> but you know, with all due respect to the vice president, he is not the president. There's not been, President Obama is a great orator, and I think at some point he needs to talk to, to the Israeli public. That would go uh, a long way. Uh, secondly, don't make unilateral demands on Israel. Always make bilateral demands. Make, make your demands uh, to both uh, sides. Number three, be serious about the Iranian issue. Somehow the impression is formed that President Obama and his administration have acquiesced in the idea that Iran will be nuclear. If you read a few days ago the memo that the Secretary of uh, Defense Gates had leaked, you can see that people in the administration are already building alibis for why Iran went nuclear. This, by the way, is not a partisan issue. This began under Bush and continues uh, under the same administration. And uh, you know, people talk about sanctions. April was uh, mentioned. F first it was December, then it was April. Well, we are approaching the end of April. I don't see, I don't see even mild sanctions in the Security Council, and certainly I don't see tough sanctions. You don't want military action, let us see sanctions. But let, let's see some, some results. It, it would make a big difference. And finally, try to understand Try to understand the nature of politics in, in the Middle East. I'd like to draw your attention to a very interesting hearing that uh, took place today in, uh, in Congress. Um, the hearing on, on the issue of uh, sending the US ambassador to Damascus. After the ambassador was recalled in 2005 after the assassination of the Prime Minister of, uh, of Lebanon. And uh, is now being, uh, now a new ambassador is being sent, Ambassador Robert Ford, a professional diplomat. Uh, and it was done as a gesture by the United States to, to the regime in, in Syria, trying to build a bilateral dialogue. And the administration decided to send the ambassador without asking the Syrians a very elementary question is, what do we get for that? Uh, because you know, the, the bazaar was invented in, in Damascus. And as uh, I learned in my own negotiations with the Syrians, you don't offer free gifts. If you offer a free gift, it's pocketed and it's gone. Every, every concession that you make or every positive step that you take should, should be reciprocated. And uh, so uh, the US announced that it was sending Robert Ford to Damascus. And what did the Syrian regime do? It took three weeks to give the agreement, the diplomatic agreement, to, to accept him as ambassador. So that we have our time, we're not in a hurry, so forth. And the next step was apparently to transfer some SCUD missiles, sophisticated SCUD missiles, to Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. So there was a hearing today uh, in, uh, in Congress, and the un Assistant Secretary of State for the Middle East, Jeff Feldman, um, uh, with a T, not with a D, was uh, grilled, I would say, by a group of angry, mostly angry uh, congressmen 
Uh, and there's some very interesting exchanges about how you deal with a country like, uh, like Syria, what is a gesture. Feldman tried to argue the administration's line that sending a, an ambassador to Damascus is not a favor to the Syrians, it's a favor to ourselves because we will have ears and eyes in, in Damascus, the congressman thought otherwise, but it's a very illuminating exchange on which highlights the need to understand that uh, the Middle East is not in Georgia or in Nebraska, it's in, uh, uh, <coughs> in southwestern uh, Asia, it's a different part of the world, different culture, and the way you conduct politics and successful diplomacy in the Middle East is different. Thank you very much. I don't know what, uh, what, what Daniel Elon was thinking. I think that uh, he was following the instructions of his boss, uh, Mr. Lieberman, the foreign minister. So uh, uh, anyway, that's uh, uh, so much for that. Now for, uh, for political reform. I would say at the heart of any reform should be a, a partial transition to a constituency system. I think that um, the advantage of a constituency system is that it creates a direct link between the voter and his or her representative. As you know, in the mother of all parliaments, in the British Parliament, you can come from whatever part of England, come to, to the building, uh, to Westminster, say, I want to meet my, uh, my MP. And the ushers will, will get you your MP from wherever in the building. That, that, personal relationship, the sense that uh, you are really represented in, uh, in power and, and the sense of obligation that the, the politician has to a constituency, I think is at the core of uh, parliamentary democracy and it's, it's missing in our, in our system. And if we adopt a Norwegian system or other systems that are familiar to us from, from Europe where you have part of, part of the uh, part is elected through a central list and part is elected um, uh, <coughs> in, a constitu in constituency. Second, uh, raise the blocking percentage from two to five. That would eliminate a certain number of, of, uh, of small, uh, small parties. I know I'm talking to, to a student who wants to write a dissertation on a small Israeli party, but <laughs> your, part, your party is safely in the past. I mean, nothing will happen to it. <laughs> Uh, thirdly, uh, <coughs> thirdly, change the uh, uh, change the primary system. We don't have open primaries, so in party primaries like in the Likud, Kadima, or Labour, 50, 60, 70 thousand people register and vote. This number is too small and can be manipulated. The part of the problem that Netanyahu has in the Likud is that a, a group of right-wingers headed by one Moshe Feiglin uh, registered a very large number of members in the Likud and they, they, got, they voted for right-wing uh, candidates and, and therefore the Likud 
path, the Likud list is, is to the right of, of the Prime Minister. If you have open primaries, it's less uh, susceptible to uh, uh, manipulation and, and games. Uh, no, I don't. I, uh, the idea has been raised that uh, unlike what happened in, in the Sinai when peace was made with Egypt and unlike what happened in Gaza when Sharon evacuated Gaza, the settlement will, will not be dismantled and the argument would be that there are a million, about 20% of Israel's population are Arab. Why can't Jews live in, in an Arab state like the future Palestinian state? Uh, I don't think this is, a, this is a practical issue. I can think of hundreds of, of security problems uh, that would end up forcing Israel to intervene on behalf of, of Jewish, Jewish settlers who continue to live in a Palestinian state. I think it's a recipe for, for disaster. Now, we're looking at more than 300,000 Israelis who live beyond the, what we call the Green Line. I would say about 240 of them can uh, around Jerusalem or in the last settlement blocks that would be annexed to Israel as part of a swap. There would still have to be a number of 50 or more thousand Israelis to be dislocated. That's a very large number. Uh, I'm afraid that if we get to that, there would be bloodshed in Israel. We're not, not going to be an, an easy transition. Uh, uh, if done, if done, uh, what should be what should be done is is to try to direct uh, people who are evacuated from the West Bank to the Galilee and to the Negev, where we are we are losing the Jewish majority, and say you want to be pioneers, you want to to fight for the Jewish future of Israel. Doing it in the Negev or the Galilee would be a pioneering mission. Yes, yes I have two U.S. government support for Israel. The first is I met on Monday with several important members of Congress involved in the Intelligence Committee and the uh, uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. And while they were, they were somewhat comfortable with the Obama strategy, but they thought very little of his tactics and his uh, uh, rhetoric. Uh, but they, point, they made an issue, a point of pointing out how Obama has been very good to Israel with a qualitative military advantage. And they thought that made a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to comment on that. And secondly, uh, as a Democrat, I've been very disturbed by the latest letter that the House of Representatives sent to uh, uh, the President. It was signed by something like 330 members of the mm -hmm. House of Representatives. 90 Democrats did not sign it, 70 Republicans did not sign it. Uh, <clears throat> so, to, to the first question, you are absolutely right. The, the defense relationship, the intelligence sharing, the qualitative age have not been affected. That, that is correct. Uh, number two, uh, I am not a great fan of these massive letters signed by 300 congressmen and senators or 370 or 420 or, or 290. It's, uh, I think it's, it, uh, that taken to be largely ceremonial. The, uh, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that none of the major Jewish figures in Capitol Hill, senator or congressman, stood up in support of Netanyahu. Nobody wants to stand for a foreign leader against the, uh, against the president. It's not, it, it's, not good policy. it's not a good policy for Israel or its friends to take on the president. You don't want to win, you don't want to lose. And 
At the end of the day, in all confrontations of this nature, be it with Carter, be it with uh, Bush, uh, uh, on Capitol Hill, at the end of the day, the administration won. Uh, so what's, what's the value of that? So I'm, I'm, I'm not in support of that. Thirdly, the question I said earlier, it's, it's a mistake to direct unilateral demands to Israel. And definitely, said part of the reciprocity is that in symbolic acts like naming uh, town squares after terrorists or in, in the contents of textbooks or what's in the media, uh, definitely the, the, there would have to be a change in, in, in Palestinian attitude to s create the sense that uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a healthy peace process on sound foundations unlike the unsuccessful peace process of the 1990s. Okay, the two, uh, first the question about the uh, Syrian gambit that Ambassador Indyk mentioned. You know, in theory, in theory, yes. In theory, um, it, would, it would be a very good move to draw Syria away from, from Iran. It would make a, a create a, a major change in, uh, in the geopolitics of the Middle East, but do we have a partner for that? Remember that Secretary Clinton spoke about that. And then the Under Secretary of State, Bill Burns, went to Syria, the most senior American official to, to visit Syria. Ahmadinejad uh, did not like that. He went to Damascus. They convened a, a summit, Syria, Iran, and Hezbollah. And the pre president of Syria, Bashar al-Assad, stood up publicly and mocked Secretary Clinton's comments. That was just uh, two weeks ago. It's not very encouraging for, um, uh, for, that, uh, uh, for that notion. So uh, uh, I think it's worth keeping on the screen, not off screen, but remember that it's going to be a very difficult uh, policy to accomplish. With regard to the, the initiative to reduce nuclear weapons or to reduce nuclear threat, you know, we are at the very, very early <coughs> phase of, of a change and all these gestures, I'd like to see how, how they have an effect on North Korea or Iran. I doubt it. Depends on the other side. Uh, Israel has said that they would not tolerate a nuclear Iran. Um, they've been waiting. They've been, I guess, trying to do things with the United States, but nothing seems to be happening. What is Israel's Uh, <coughs> the, uh, uh, you know, you're pointing to the prospect of, of military action. It, it's, you know, it's not off the table. It's not a very attractive option. Uh, when you, there were two instances in the past when Israel destroyed the Iraqi nuclear reactor in 1981 and then the Syrian North Korean reactor in September 2007. These were two, two isolated, very successful coups. You dealt with uh, one, uh, one facility uh, over ground, or on the ground. In the Iranian case, you're dealing with multiple locations, most of them dug deeply underground. Iran is further away. In order to get to Iran, it's very difficult for Israel to do that without overflying Iraq, where the sky is dominated by the United States. In other words, it's very difficult to do it 
without American consent. America made it very clear that it does not want to see such, such an action. So leave it to us. We'll, we have other ways. If, if, it, if it happens, and it, it may not be successful, if, if it's successful, it may only push the Iranians back for a couple of, of years. And thirdly, there will, in all likelihood, be a very massive Iranian retaliation. One reason for having 40,000 rockets and missiles with Hezbollah in Lebanon uh, is uh, to use them to retaliate in the event of an Israeli attack or an American attack on, uh, on Iran. So that, that is a fairly unattractive uh, scenario. Uh, there are situations where there are no attractive options. You sometimes have to go for the least unattractive option. We have time for one more question, Professor. Uh, you talked earlier about the uh, opinions of the intelligentsia here in the United States and the question of whether there's a deterioration in their view of Israel, and you mentioned some factors. But would you like to elaborate on that further and give us your view on that? Uh, just to say what the position, what, what do you see in the future about the position of the American intellectuals? Uh, and that means not only in our kind of setting on campus, but also in the media and, oh, and say, at the level of junior advisors in government where that kind of deterioration would show up early. Uh, <coughs> yeah, not, uh, by the way, uh, uh, not every campus in the Oral Roberts University uh, is really doing very well. Uh, <coughs> uh, you know, you, you need to look at Europe. Europe is well as a is a real problem. I, I can I can tell you uh, something that I'm involved with right now. We uh, I'm part of a of a large international prize, three one million dollar prizes that's given every year. Uh, this year, one of the prizes is given to two international authors, uh, Margaret Atwood, a Canadian, and Amitav Ghosh, the Indian writer. Yeah, bo both amply deserve the prize, and, and both have been under a very severe attack in the last few weeks. Email offensive, don't go to Israel, don't legitimize Israel by doing that, how can you as a woman, how can you as an Indian? Uh, and it's an, it's an organized campaign, and you know, the, much of it is orchestrated. Uh, for instance, the Israel Apartheid Week is orchestrated. You find that certain number of European NGOs finance it on campuses and you find that the money comes mostly from certain European governments, the, the websites are directed from the Middle East. This is not just a, a spontaneous expression of, of popular sentiment. It's, it's, an organized, it's an organized campaign, but on European campuses it's very difficult for an Israeli speaker to speak. In some cultural events now there is heckling, uh, here, you know, at uh, UC Irvine, when Ambassador Oren, the Israeli ambassador to Washington, went to speak, there was a disruption. He's going to speak at Georgetown, and there's talk about uh, a disruption that is expected here. I'm told that here, uh, Norman Finkelstein was invited to, to give a talk at NYU the other day, and that there were a thousand, uh, thousand people in attendance. That's NYU. So uh, I'd say this is not inevitable, and this, this is something that, uh, that can change with a change of policy and some, some changes in tactics. Israel could stem the tide and, and change the image, but if nothing happens, the erosion will continue. Uh, thank you. I would like, on behalf of all of us, to thank our speaker for a marvelous